So thankful for the presence of God in our midst this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As you know, each one of us are uh, here by the grace of God. And let us give thanks to the Lord as we are here with one heart and one mind before the Lord. Let us, as we have our opening from God's word, let us, uh, let us have an open heart. As we sang in one of the Malayalam songs, that uh, eternal words come from Jesus Christ alone. Where else can we go except to him directly? Hallelujah. As you know, we're going through the series, Looking Unto Jesus. Um, if you turn to the next slide, we, we are going through a systematic way of covering the life and the ministry of Jesus. We spent, uh, uh, since the beginning of the year, we've been uh, meditating on Hebrews chapter 11. And we covered that portion, and now we are in the Gospels. We uh, have been talking about the birth uh, of Jesus, and last week uh, we covered about Mary. I'll be continuing sort of from that, uh, but uh, today um, I want to highlight the last forerunner to Christ, which is not indicated in Hebrews, although it may be. It is John the Baptist. So let us turn to John chapter 1, 35 to 42, and this will be my last verse I will read in the message, God willing. Uh, but I will start there just as our key verse. John chapter 1, 35 through 42. And it reads here, The next day again, John, John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Hallelujah. Today, as, I, as uh, the time that I have, I really just want to highlight uh, portions of John the Baptist's life, uh, his pre-birth uh, and then his childhood into his early ministry, the testimonies that John the Baptist had toward about Jesus, and then finally what Jesus had to say about John the Baptist. So, you know, covering sort of covering what we talked about last time, uh, we heard about Mary, who was an uh, unmarried but betrothed virgin, um, was... Um, approached by an angel and, uh, and told about this miraculous event that was going to happen in her life. She, of course, was not, not at all prepared for that, um, yet she trusted in the will of the Lord. And in the same time, and, may, and actually before, months before that, God has, was dealing with her cousin, Elizabeth, and her husband, Zachariah. And uh, we see here... Two narratives happening about uh, one to John the Baptist to be, and also as we talked about last week, Jesus. Um, it's really interesting. Um, in in different ways, we see the hand of the Lord. One upon a much older couple who have been praying, and you know the Bible declared um, Elizabeth as barren, um, and uh, this has been a prayer request in the, uh, among that couple for many years, and then. Suddenly, without uh, expecting, an angel appears before Zachariah in the middle of his ministry, in his appointed time, and uh, John and, and Zachariah just did it, just could not believe what the angel was saying. The very same things he was praying about when he heard a promise or a fulfillment of that to come, Zachariah suddenly um, had a sense of unbelief, and this is really not something that we're foreign to, we sometimes experience this as well. So here are two women um, that are rel- related, but they, they are now linking up together here. In Luke chapter 1, 39 and 44, 
uh, it will hopefully be on the screen. It says, in those days, this is after the pronouncement uh, that of Mary that she will be pregnant and, and, uh, and overshadowed by the Holy Spirit to bear a child whose name will be Jesus. In those days, Mary arose and went in, with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is, the, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. There are many things to take from here. I, you know, I'm going to be very, maybe very raw and instructive on certain things. But when we think about this, one, one thought should come to our heart, heart is that both babies are highlighted here. Uh, both babies are in the womb. And, and, we, in, and we are in a cultural moment where this has become such a politicized and a divisive issue that it is, it's even, these debates are even creeping into the church. There should not be any debate in the church about this issue, about the sanctity of life. Now, how that, how that dwells into the political sphere is not, in my view, it's not none of my business to talk about it on the, in the pulpit. What I say is this, that when it comes to politics, whoever, whichever side gets paid more, there's, those views get uh, promoted. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of time. These things flip-flop all the time based on uh, the currents and the trends of the time, but we know we should know one thing that in the Church of Jesus Christ, that we should stand on the Word of God and the sanctity of human life from the womb to the tomb, as they say, should be protected. Every human life, starting from conception, conception should be valued and protected. And no one should better understand this than children of God. When we look at the when we look at this, the, 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 the portion that just read here, here is Mary, her voice, her greetings, um, fulfilled a, a promise that was upon this baby John the Baptist, right? Uh, if, if you read, there's a portion that, uh, that when the angel comes, angel prophesies that this child will be filled in the spirit in the womb. So just imagine the wonder of a, a child could be, a, could be filled in the spirit in the womb. That, is a, that could be a prayer that we pray for our children if, if we are in that state of life where we have a child in the womb, praying that the child will be filled in the Spirit. And here's also the difference between Jesus and John the Baptist. You know, so John the, John the Baptist was filled in the Spirit in the womb, but Jesus was born in the womb of Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit here. So here is God in flesh being formed in the womb of Mary and through the voice of Mary, the God who was in the womb of Mary caused this other baby in the womb of Elizabeth to be filled in the Holy Spirit. And Elizabeth is filled in the Holy Spirit. She exclaims with a loud cry. It's also another example of when we are filled in the Holy Spirit, praises will come out of our lips. No one has to tell you to praise. No one has to push you to praise. When you are filled in the Spirit, the, the natural reaction to that is that praises will arise from our lips. Because it comes from a deep joy. It comes from a deep peace. It comes from an overflowing experience as we heard in the previous weeks. An overflowing experience of the waters gushing out. Praises will come out of our lips. And so here Mary, uh, Elizabeth is testifying to Mary, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now, when I look at this, I see two women, you know, God brought this together for a reason because I'm imagining in a very natural sense, Mary is perhaps, toil, you know, probably juggling with thoughts. Is this really from the, from the Lord? Is this... You know, what is happening to me? And so no one else can understand what Mary is going through, right? Even Joseph, before he was told, he wanted, he was being a righteous man, wanted to quietly divorce Mary. He didn't want to embarrass her and put her out in the public to maybe 
cause her to be stoned or anything like that. He wanted to quietly divorce her. So even he could not understand the heart of Mary, but Elizabeth could. And so God created this encounter with Elizabeth and Mary so that when Elizabeth was filled in the spirit, she confirmed the reality and the truth in what is happening to Mary, saying that you are blessed among women. You're not cursed. This may have happened to you at an untimely time. You know, I'm, think, I'm again talking in a very natural sense. This may have been an inconvenience to you. You were bet- you are betrothed to a man and now you found yourself pregnant. What could society say about you? But here in the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth is proclaiming another reality. A reality that is not known to the public, but only to her and the Lord through this experience that Elizabeth is experiencing she understands, and she being filled with the Spirit, understands what is happening to Mary. And so she is declaring her blessed. And she is blessed because of the fruit in her womb. She's blessed because Jesus is within her. Hallelujah. And she goes on to say, why is it the grant to me that the mother of my Lord? Again, calling this baby that is growing in, in, in Mary's womb, Lord. Declaring the divinity and the messiahship of Christ even before he was out into the world. Hallelujah. So what, what is, what, how, how does Elizabeth discern that her baby has been filled in the spirit? She senses when Mary said, uh, gre- greeted out loud and she came to Elizabeth's house. The baby leaped in joy. And so she also filled in the Holy Spirit. She knew the baby has been filled in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You know, one thing as I was preparing, a, a thought came to my heart about the, this, uh, this whole thing about children and the timing of God and how God orchestrates these things. You know, so many times, you know, and I don't know if this is an Indian mentality, but, you know, sometimes we tie our life circumstances around the birth of our children. You know, like we might say, oh, when my child was born, things flourished in my life, you know, or when my child was born, everything crashed down, and nobody says that out loud, but of course, internally, we wrestle with that, it's like, man, after this child was born, everything seemed to go out of order, so one thing to think about in the, that circumstance is, the, if Jesus himself, Jesus identifying with humanity, his birth was in many ways untimely. His birth was a great inconvenience in a very natural sense. If you think about it, I just mentioned that, that Jesus messed up the plans of Mary and Joseph to a lot of extent, right? They were supposed to have this uh, betrothal, and after that, Joseph was supposed to take Mary into his home. They were supposed to be married and have this, this you know, quote-unquote, dream life, wonderful life. But all of a sudden, they find themselves in a situation where Mary is pregnant, and Joseph is already trying to let go of her. And then now that Joseph understands what is happening, they're now, they're now you know, toiling to go to Bethlehem. And then you know, they can't find a place to stay to, to have, to, to, so Mary can give birth. I mean, there's problems after problems happening here. Things are not working out in a natural sense. And then not to mention, after he was born, there, there were confirmations of people coming, uh, you know, shepherds came, the, the, the magi came, but at the same time, they had to escape the hand of Herod, right? They, 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 they're finding themselves you know, running through the night with a, with a young child. Again, Jesus humbling himself to be identified with the trials and the suffering of this world. And, and, and so we see here that, that, Jesus identifies with those, especially if you have a thought that I have only been a curse. I have only been a problem child. I've only been a complaint to my, my parents. Just link yourself with Jesus and, and, and see, see the hand of God in Jesus' life and know that, that, yes, there may have been problems that arose with your birth, but there's a purpose behind that. That it sometimes the most troublesome situations is where the glory of God is revealed and your birth is not an accident. Your birth has been planned out by a sovereign God. You need to take comfort in that, knowing that 
I am not an accident. I am not a curse. I am, I am born here for a purpose. God had a plan in orchestrating these events. Those of us who have been parents multiple times or even uh, or trying to be parents know how difficult it is for a child to be formed. We cry and we pray and we tears. Many of us have lost children even in the womb. We understand the, 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 the miracle that is life. And so for a child to come fully healthy or partially healthy, whatever condition, just a child to come be born, in itself, it's a great miracle. So we need to be thankful to the Lord. Lord, thank you for giving me life. Thank you for giving me purpose. I am not an accident. I am not a curse. It doesn't matter even the closest person to us has said that. Do not believe the lie of the enemy. Even if others have said that to you, know that the Lord has a distinct purpose. He has placed value over your life. And Jesus understands what you have been through. Hallelujah. Now when we look at John the Baptist, Luke chapter 1, verses 80, he talks about John the Baptist. The child grew and became strong in the spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So here's another kind of situation. You know, Zachariah and Elizabeth are praying and praying for a child. They receive the promised child. But then they also know that this child is not someone that they were destined to enjoy and, and to play with and to, and to have, you know, memories, build memories with, even from a childhood. And maybe we can assume many things. It may be because they wanted their, they knew that there was, this, there was a distinct promise and a purpose for John that they seemed to send him off into the wilderness or they may have passed away in his childhood. We don't know the exact uh, details, but, um, you know, I can't go into too much detail about this, but if you look into Dead Sea Scrolls and, and, uh, and John the Baptist, if you just, uh, and make sure your sources are good and all that, but Dead Sea Scrolls and John the Baptist, you'll see that there was this community in the Qumran region, K-U-M-R-A-N, Qumran region, that they see, uh, when these Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, there were some writings, along with the many copies of the Old Testament, that uh, they, they were writings that aligned a lot with the teachings of John the Baptist. And there's, there's scholars do theorize that, that maybe John the Baptist's early training was in this wilderness community, that they, they, uh, they lived a ascetic life, separated from the world. They lived in caves, and, and they, they didn't want to be part of anything in the world. But when we look at the ministry of John the Baptist, it was a public ministry. He was ministering to, to you know, there will be soldiers coming. There will be Pharisees coming. There will be regular people coming into the wilderness hearing that there's a prophet. That, that, you know, that is, and he was calling people into repentance to prepare the way of the Lord. His ministry was to prepare people for the Messiah to come. Why was that important? And now I'll go into that here in a little bit as, as we now go to Matthew chapter 3, 1 to 12. And I'm skipping around just to hi- give highlights of John the Baptist's life. Matthew chapter 3, 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Verse 4, Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all region about Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able, to, uh, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Why was John the Baptist's ministry so intense? Compared to even, I would say, there are elements you can see in Jesus' ministry where he talks about hell and fire 
hellfire and all those things. But John the Baptist's ministry was an intense ministry of a short few years. They're both, you know, Jesus and John the Baptist are, you know, just a few months apart. John the Baptist may not, may not have known how, how long his life lasted, but he knew that there was one distinct purpose that John the Baptist was on earth for. It is to prepare for the Messiah that was going to come in his lifetime. And, and, and knowing about Jesus, you know, knowing about maybe from his parents about Jesus, he knew that the Messiah was there on, uh, uh, you know, on earth. And he was waiting for that time where he will recognize and see the Messiah. So why was repentance necessary at that time? We know this when we are... are Living in unrepentant sin, and Pastor uh, Matthew D. Samuel alluded to this. When we are living in uh, unrepentant sin, the, the, our eyes can be darkened to see the hand of God sometimes. Our eyes can be darkened to see the wonders of God's word. And so, so it was necessary for the, the people that, the people to come into repentance so that when Jesus came into the scene, they would hear and they would see the Messiah. They, that they would be able to be, they will be able to be taught. And led by the Messiah. Now when Pharisees and Sadducees came. Seeing well. They were, they were not coming really to be baptized. They were coming to, to see what is going on. And so John the Baptist is very strong with them. Calling them brood of vipers. Family of snakes. That's essentially what he's saying. So he, here you know. We can also take, take a, a look at this and say. You know. We can see the danger of unrepentant religiosity. It's a form of darkness that I believe, and, and forgive me if I'm being strong, it is even darker than sometimes the darkness of unbelievers. When we mix the things of God with sin, things of God with things of this world, it forms a kind of ugly darkness that not even in the pulpit anybody can speak to and 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 bring light and repentance out of it because it, it forms a stronghold because you're so used to the things of God. You're so used to acting spiritual, but you also have this other thing going on in your life. So isn't that even worse than the state of an unbeliever? Because an unbeliever can say, my eyes were completely dark and I didn't know. They're walking out of ignorance, but, but this unrepentant religiosity, the person like that cannot say, with a sincere heart, that I was walking out of ignorance. And this is why we preach the gospel, and this is why we focus on the gospel every Sunday. This is why we sing songs about the cross every Sunday, to awaken some hearts, so that we don't walk in two boats, that we don't walk in hypocrisy. Because the same message applies to you and me. Bear fruit keeping with repentance. Don't think you have all your life left to go. Don't plan out 20, 30 years of your life. There's an axe laid to the root of the tree. Every tree that does not bear good fruit can be cut down and thrown into the fire. This is a, it's a gentle warning for you and for me. Hallelujah. Now, when we look at the testimony of Jesus about John and my time is running out now I'll, I'll end with this I will tell you among those born of women none is greater than John yet the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he it seems like two contradictory statements among those born of women none is greater than John yet the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he among all the prophets and the ministers of God, John the Baptist is the most privileged. He not only got to be the last forerunner to Christ, but he had the distinct honor and privilege to baptize Jesus. He was able to see the heavens open and hear the Father's voice, to see the Spirit of God coming as a dove. He was able to testify about that. So none is greater than, none born of women is greater than John. But at the same time, Jesus says, the, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This talks about us. Now, I don't, you know, Jesus talks about who is least and greatest. We know all those verses. 
But there's a, the word John had privilege compared to Old Testament saints, he didn't have that, that privilege compared to the New Testament saints. John's life was abrupt and it ended really fast. As we know, he didn't get to see the fulfillment of all the prophecies, the Messiah dying and being buried and resurrected and ascended. He didn't get to, and he didn't get to experience Pentecost. He, there are a lot of things that he missed out on, but we who have, who knows the entire history from beginning to now continuing on, Acts continued in, in this current millennia. We are far greater in the kingdom of God than even John the Baptist. And that should humble us. We know so much, church. We have so much privilege, church of God. We, we understand the mystery that is not, has been hidden for ages and ages. That in Christ, all people should be united together as one. We know the mysteries that are hidden in scriptures being revealed week after week, day after day. We are being taught by the Holy Spirit and by men and women of God. We, have, we, are, we, are, we are so saturated in God's word that we, have, we are so much privileged in the kingdom of God. And in that respect, we can give thanks and praise to God. Hallelujah. We can give thanks and praise to God this morning. That someone as powerful, someone as as, as a, a firebrand as John the Baptist is lesser than us in the kingdom because we have been given the grace and even as Gentiles not even part of the commonwealth of Israel being brought into the fold as a wild olive, uh, olive shoot being grafted into the, the, the olive tree how much more privileged are we there are a lot of things that John the Baptist was ignorant about he, because he didn't know. He didn't see. His ministry was the preparing the way of the Lord. He didn't get to experience everything that, that Jesus did and, 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 and will do. But here we are, 2,000 years plus later. We are now preparing for one day when our Savior will return. That is when the judgment will, will occur. The things that John the Baptist prophesied. It didn't take place in in the first coming, but it will in the second coming when the winnowing fork will be in the hand of Jesus where there will be a separation between weed and chaff. And so we we need to live our days on this earth with fear and trembling, but also with joy knowing that our salvation has been granted by Jesus Christ. That our salvation has been done by Jesus. That we can, we can rely on the blood of Christ for the cleansing of our sins. For the forgiveness of our sins. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. Through the open body and the shed blood of Jesus. That we can approach him and call, and call our father, Abba Father. That we can approach the throne of grace. And, and we know that there's a high, great, Jesus our high, great high priest. Seated at the right hand of the father. Interceding for us. That these privileges that we experience. Do not take it lightly. Brothers and sisters, hallelujah. Let us uh, stand up in the presence of God this morning. Let us worship the Lord together. Hallelujah.